hello everyone. My name is Tandisa and I'm currently doing my master's at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And my research project is 3D functional skull morphology and acoustic signal design, a theme and a cross species analysis of horseshoe beds in Southern Africa. So to give a brief introduction, bats are national mammals and they are found almost everywhere with exceptions to polar regions and extreme deserts. They have evolved echolocation primarily for orientation and for aging. So with echolocation, they are able to use the reflected echoes to create an acoustic image that tells them almost everything about the environment, which is similar to the image created by light in human vision. Um, the echolocation is ultrasonic, which means that we cannot, um, it's not audible to human ear. So the echolocation called design is very complex and sophisticated. However, we are grateful to acoustics that we are able to analyze it. So the echolocation called design is made up of a um, is made up of a frequency modulated component, the, the constant frequency component, as well as the um, the frequency, as well as the frequency modulated component. So as you can see from our graph, um, A shows the frequency modulated component, and then B shows the constant frequency component, and then C um, shows the frequency modulated component. But our main focus is the CF component. So the CF component is mainly for detection, and they also use it for the acoustic things, especially when they are prey is flying, so they are able to um, detect their flying prey. Um, the CF component has a frequency, has a peak frequency, um, which is our main focus. The peak frequency is an adaptive trait and is highly variable because it gets acted upon by um, many selection forces, which includes climate as well as the body size. However, the structures that emit the sound can also cause variation in the acoustic um, signals. So our observation was that similar bat um, species call at different frequencies and then sometimes different uh, bat species call at same um, frequencies. So we wanted to know what is causing this phenomenon. So as you can see from um, our spectrograms, our sonograms, um, the first graph shows the Rhinolophus lazi, which falls at approximately 84 kilohertz, uh, while the Rhinolophus hildebrand only falls at about 32 kilohertz, <coughs> and the Rhinolophus dentis falls around about uh, 92 um, kilohertz. So they are all from the same, speed, um, same family, but they all fall at different frequencies. So that's what we're trying to understand. So we went back to our literature and looked at the skull morphology because climate and body size have been frequently studied and there's a lot more information about it. So we wanted to look at something different. So the skull performs uh, many functions which includes the vestibulatory function as well as the sensory function. Um, but our interest was on the sound emission function. So uh, there is a trade-off that happens when there is an optimization of one function um, and then there are changes that happen. So for an example with bite force, so if the, the bite force is the one optimized function, then the other function might um, be less optimized and that causes changes in the skull and those changes may further have implications on the sound emission. So the sound waves produced by the vocal cords are further filtered by the vocal tract in which the nasal capsule plays an important role in the emitted sound into the environment. So now we're looking at the nasal capsule as our feature of interest in the skull morphology. So our nasal capsule are acoustic horns for sound emission and therefore they influence the acoustic properties of the, em of the emitted sound which further impacts the sound propagation in the environment. So the influence on the skull shape or features um, may change the acoustic properties and further result in the evolution of local acoustic calls. So this means that change in the nasal capsule have an effect on echolocation. And this you can see it um, with humans. So whenever we have flu and our nose are blocked and there is less volume, you can see that your voice projection changes. 
Hence, the variation in style, shape, and features may result in the, uh, in the acoustic signal change. So, our research question was that the variation in style morphology co-vary with the variation in echolocation frequency. So, we want to know if there is a relationship, which brings us to our aim, which is to investigate um, the relationship between the variation in style morphology and echolocation frequency. So we'll then analyze the skull features using um, a 3D geometric morphometrics. And then our hypothesis is to find out if there is a correlation um, between the skull morphology and the echolocation frequency. So for our methodology, we are using the Southern African bat, as you can see from the map there, and then these are all the species that we are going to be using. And then all the species that are highlighted are the species that we currently do not have at the moment, but we will receive them from uh, the museums. No, no. Um, so for our methodology, we will then analyze um, our data we will send all the skull images to NEXA for micro uh, focus X-ray tomography, and then they will be able to scan our, um, our our images, and then they can send them to us so that we can view them on morphotic uh, morphotic software, so that we can view them <coughs> and place our landmarks. So with the landmarks, we'll be able to get the shape. We'll be able to get the shape, the size, as well as the volume of our skulls and then we will use all that information to analyze if there are differences in the shape, um, the size as well as the volume of the nasal capsule. So um, I had pictures that you could have seen what I was talking about. So we'll place the landmarks um, around the skull and then we will use all the information we're going to gather from um, the size, the shape as well as um, the volume to find if there are differences uh, between within and across um, across the species. So for our analysis, um, we are still currently scanning the cell, so we don't have our, our results yet. However, we used what has been published to kind of give us an picture <coughs> of what um, we might be expecting. So um, we formed a study by Jay Cox at L2 and They found that they get a relationship uh, between the native tattoo as well as the frequency, the peak frequency. And then also a study by Old now on our sequences, they also found the same result. Um, that the native chamber net was the best predictor for peak frequency. And then the same was also found by Mudun, um, which is one of my supervisors. However, my study was a different because I will not be focusing on one species. I'll be focusing on all the 25 species and then also show if there is a correlation across the species. So the next steps are, I will be analyzing the data of the skull and then I will compare the horseshoe bear species with the hippocidural species to get the acoustic analysis, which is something that has not been done before to my knowledge. And then, um, why did I choose this study? It's because that's a wonderful <laughs> but besides that, I just want to advance the understanding of the relationship between the skull morphometrics as well as the acoustic signal design. So, um, thank you so much to my supervisors, collaborators, and founders, and for you for listening. Yeah,